Hello and welcome back to Philosophy and Humor. And this week we are going to look at relief theories of humor. This is module six, which will conclude essentially the first half of this course before we have a midterm test next week. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but what we're going to look at this week in particular is what relief theories actually are, what they consist of, their relationship to the incongruity theory that we talked about last week, because there is a fair amount of overlap. But we are going to, uh, first of all, like we normally do, have a look at the sort of the main ideas from last week's module, module five on incongruity theories. Okay. What that is, is laughing at things that shouldn't be sort of sitting side by side. There's a disconnect between these two things, but they seem to coexist. And the coexistence uh, is the source of laughter rather than anxiety. And also, too, is the fact that we can often laugh at things that aren't about uh, other people's shortcomings. We're not laughing at people. We can be laughing at all kinds of things, animals, ideas, uh, things, right? It doesn't really matter. But ultimately, we think incongruity, we're laughing at things that are coming together in this kind of incompatible way. Uh, James Beattie is really the first person that uh, articulates this idea as incongruity. So it is to Beattie's work that we're going to sort of look at in this notion of laughter arising from the view of incongruous parts, right? That comic amusement is a deviation from some presupposed norm and expectation. Now, that idea is also very important in relief theory because when we talk about expectation the the build up whether it's narrative build up uh, and even with a very short joke there is still a kind of narrative that is developed we anticipate a certain ending and we are um the, well the anticipation is subverted or thwarted in some way by the punchline so there is there is still this preconceived expectation or norm that you have to have in your head in order for the joke to work. Otherwise, if you're not aware of those, you're not sure of that which is being made fun of. Now, Kant and Schopenhauer talk about uh, similar things in the 1800s. We're talking about uh, incongruities in terms of the, uh, the pleasure of laughter uh, from things that are destroying reason. And this is, of course, strange things that shouldn't be happening but are. But again, to the degree that they cause laughter, not anxiety and fear. Uh, Schopenhauer has this really interesting idea uh, that we have about ourselves and our relationship to the world, and we hold in our heads usually, and I keep stressing this, this notion of uh, the two parts of our brain working at the same time. And on the one side, uh, in the same way as I mentioned earlier, we know what should be occurring, right, that expectation or anticipation versus what is actually happening. Schopenhauer is something similar when he says we have a version of the world that we hold in our heads, which is probably a bit more ideal than, than it actually is. And that not matching up, right, that deviation or that disconnect or that, uh, that distortion between that ideal world that we think that should be out there and what's actually happening, that incongruity can lead to laughter. And again, to a certain degree, we know that uh, not all uh, deviations are worthy of laughter. That's just not the case. But at least here in our this context, that's what's occurring. Uh, Kierkegaard thinks much like Schopenhauer in the sense that comedy and humor is that that tool, right? That that gift that we have that allows us to deal with those incongruities, right? The inability to reconcile an ideal world with a real world because it will always be deviations. And if we can laugh at those contradictions because they are somewhat painless, uh, we're likely to get through life without too much trouble. And finally, Roger Scruton uh, talked about how we as human beings just simply prefer a congruous world, right? We're not crazy about incongruities. Uh, we're not really, uh, we're not, in, we don't enjoy things that are irrational and unreasonable. We tend to really uh, think that common sense is the order of the day. And for the most part, it is. But periodically, there are going to be some deviations that will cause laughter. And if we can deal with life that way, we're more likely to, to just uh, be less anxious overall. And so those critics of incongruity theory, such as Scruton, say that you know, the punchline uh, resolves the incongruity. It doesn't present it. It actually resolves it. And <clears throat> that resolution is what causes the, the humor in the first place. So that's kind of an overview very quickly of incongruity. 
So now we're going to sort of segue nicely into relief theory. And as I've just pointed out, there are certain similarities and overlaps between these two. But certainly in relief theory, we think of this idea that whatever contradiction that we are we are talking about or experiencing typically is resolved either through laughter or can be resolved through a joke that points out that contradiction but we're we're smiling rather than being fearful right we're smiling rather than than anxious and and afraid or angry even so humor does kind of dissipate the kind of stress we may experience over contradictions so relief theories right are characterized by this idea that laughter involves um the individual releasing right of that that energy that we have to sometimes hold a lid down on unconscious thoughts and the better we can do that then the more sane we alleged we allegedly are um, but there is a fair amount of psychic energy that goes into simply living day to day and uh knowing what those expectations and norms and uh you know behaviors that we wish others would follow through with because we think about it as well but there is in relief theory and certainly humor related to it that releasing of that energy that otherwise goes towards being a normal rational person uh, we release that energy through laughter rather than through any kind of uh, situation that may be causing anxiety now aristotle is believed to have written a book uh, would have been the second book of his poetics and the uh the belief and we know this through secondhand information uh information written about this second book that we simply don't have and in this particular book uh the the second book aristotle is talking about this idea that belongs in tragedy called catharsis and so what is important with catharsis and i'm just going to read a very short passage here this is a great big book right here the dictionary of untranslatables look how thick it is and this is a section on catharsis it says the word catharsis initially was connected with rituals of purification be before becoming a hippocratic term in the theory of humors interesting isn't it so well for me um, so it is actually related to the theory of humors that we talked about in, uh, as early as uh, the second week into this course. So Aristotle's poetics inflected its meaning by maintaining in opposition to Plato that tragedy in theater can care for the soul by giving it pleasure. In the traditional translation as purgation or to purge an ill feeling, um, it was part of the French classical discourse on tragedy before re reappearing in its Greek form in uh, works by, say, Lessing, uh, talking about uh, Corneille's criticism. Don't worry so much about that. But what is important is what's coming up here. Um, in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy, the cathartic method uh, that Freud gradually disengaged from and its associations with hypnosis is connected with the, the idea of an emotional discharge that makes it possible through language because everything is through language it's our only access to reality to eliminate the affect bound up of the traumatic event so what all of this is uh, really relating to is how catharsis can both heal and purge so the words the words oscillation between the meanings purification and purgation as in or purge while remaining constant throughout various languages has continually provided material for polemics and reinterpretations okay so in english what does that really mean i'm going to fold this book back up here it means that catharsis is a kind of release it's uh purging ill feelings and we'll talk about this exactly what these ill feelings are as we go through this material because relief theory often has to do with taboo subjects and they are taboo for a reason uh, sexuality, uh, religion, issues that um, we need to be careful of when we talk about it in mixed company or with just other people. They're taboo subjects for a reason. And so the implication of catharsis is that we get to talk about it within the confines of a joke or a very short uh, comedy routine. And the energy, the psychic energy that is used to hold these things down is now kind of temporarily set aside. And the energy that was normally expended holding the kind of holding a lid on things that energy is now sort of siphoned off towards laughter and we feel purged uh there's a kind of purification we we feel better uh 
think about the essays that some of you have written about is humor and emotion. And those of you that said yes, uh, you said, for example, that there's a feeling of lightheadedness. There's a feeling of elation. Well, the same kind of thing is going on here. So Aristotle viewed comedy in much the same way as tragedy. There was a kind of purifying feeling and we could laugh at things and think about them at the same time. Whether Aristotle looked at uh, humor in a kind of educational uh, manner, like the way that Plato did, that would also would be helpful. We get to think about our ill behavior and we think about better ways to do things. But regardless, the notion of catharsis is a very important one in Greek theater in both tragedy and comedy, ironically enough. Two almost completely different styles of, of, uh, of I'm going to say cinema, but of theater. But tragedy and comedy, although they, they really occupy opposite ends in theater, do the same thing. They purge their audience of certain feelings. And so uh, this is often the argument with violent video games, is that it's a kind of cathartic experience. You get to blow up, you know, Martians and monsters and demons or whatever, and you feel better. You almost feel, you know, expended because you've engaged vicariously through the game in the same way as you would vicariously experience a taboo subject in a joke and you're purged of those feelings. So this video that's coming up here really has to do with uh, catharsis. Uh, but what I'd like you to do is watch just basically the first half. If you look at, uh, as I normally do, just down here, if you look at the uh, the link for this first uh, clip, Greek tragedy and comedy, I'm asking you to watch it basically up to about the, the four, four or five minute mark, um, basically the first half. Now, by all means, you can watch the whole thing, but it's the, the first half that I, I want you to watch and think about. And then uh, when you're done, uh, come on back and we'll carry on. <coughs> Excuse me. So we carry on here with uh, relief theories and the Earl of Shots, Shaftesbury, uh, living in the 1600s, right, the 17th century. Uh, as early as the 17th century, uh, ideas about humor uh, are viewed through this lens, this lens of releasing repressed, naturally free spirits, that cathartic right, experience. And that is certainly a view that's shared much later by Freud, and we'll talk about that in more detail. But the idea that jokes liberate the energy that is usually used by rationality uh, to basically view the world as somehow rational and reasonable and making sure that we understand what is going on. Uh, what is being held down is the child within us, right? That is infantile, that likes stupid things and silly words and fart jokes and things like that. So these feelings, which as we get older, we try to repress because we're adults and not kids. Um, sometimes certain types of humor are just especially absurdist humor and just things that are very silly, lots of kind of Monty Python type stuff would fit under this category. And we get to, you know, find and get back in touch with that kind of infantile stupidity that as we get older, we like to, we like to think we set aside, but we can sort of tap into it very easily. And therein lies the idea of um, a feeling of uh, sort of almost recognizing, yeah, you know, I used to think this way, but as an adult, I, I can't. But there is certainly a kind of liberation that is experienced through uh, through a joke. Now, this clip here, uh, a couple of minutes long, uh, this is from an episode of Friends where Ross finds out about Chandler and Monica. Uh, Monica, now I don't watch the show, but I know that Monica is Ross's sister. And therein lies the whole, you know, the, the crux of the gag. So think about jokes liberating the energy expended by rationality or in this case, anger, <laughs> uh, to repress infantile stupidity and prejudicial feelings. So very briefly, uh, Ross finds out about Chandler and Monica. So watch his reaction, and especially around the two-minute mark, I cannot think of a better example of relief theory than the expression on Ross's face. So have a look at that one. A couple minutes, well, it's about three minutes long total, but around the two-minute mark, when it's, he hears what's going on. Watch for his reaction because it is quintessentially uh, an example of relief theory. Okay, so now we're moving a little further along to the 1800s or the 19th century, and we are going to discuss Herbert Spencer. And Herbert Spencer is sort of a very early, not even a psychoanalyst at this point, but simply a psychologist, right? Someone who's interested in the mind. And 
Spencer provides for us another formulation of relief theory. And he was interested in very much the same sort of thing as the Earl Shosbury, for example, um, which is how something that could be incongruous can be transformed into laughter. Because typically, if something is incongruous, it would cause us some degree of grief or anxiety. But instead, that anxiety is transformed into laughter. And again, I keep stressing this kind of sliding scale from mild to severe. And I think Spencer at this point is talking about mild incongruity, mild deviations. And he too came up with a similar idea, which is that this laughter is associated with the release of that nervous energy because we're not quite sure what's going to happen in the story. So we'll break it down this way. And it's, it's not rocket science. It's pretty straightforward, but it has to do with anticipation and expectation. And certainly, uh, those prescriptive views of the world, the world should be the following. So what happens is this, the story, right? The comic narrative begins to create a kind of tension in the very short amount of time that it's, it's being told to us or we're reading it. You can see some of these on Facebook and your know, friends will tell you jokes. Typically, it's in three parts. The first part establishes the premise. The second part repeats that established premise. So there's consistency, maybe with a slight deviation. And in the third one, boom, there's the punchline, right? There's the kicker. So what's happening in as brief as maybe a minute and a half as it takes to tell the joke, there is a buildup and an expectation because we are now, we now are hooked on the narrative and we are storytelling people. We love narratives. How many times have we been on the bus or sitting somewhere and all of a sudden we are so preoccupied with someone else's conversation with a friend? Because that's just who we are, right? We're just storytelling creatures. So we hear a joke, the same mechanism kicks in. So we start listening and there's a kind of tension being built up based on the anticipation of what we think will happen. And we're doing this because we're basing it on the first two parts that we've heard because it starts and the same structure is repeated. So we're thinking, okay, same kind of thing's gonna occur, but we don't know. So there's a degree of anticipation. So that expectation or that anticipation is thwarted by something that is just kind of weird, but it's still funny. It's not so weird that it frightens us. Uh, it's called a punchline, of course, but that nervous energy that is created and embellished around that narrative, however short it may be, is that kind of nervous energy that we suddenly feel is released when all of a sudden it's not a big deal. It's a, it's a funny ending, but it was funny because we had built up a certain expectation or anticipation of how it was going to end and it didn't end badly. It actually ended it just fine. So it's, it's a way to look at how the joke operates and humor in this case, if you're going to just say not what is a joke, but why is the joke? Why is it funny? What's, what's working here and it's just that it's a build up uh or build up of the narrative our in you know, brief investment into it we suddenly have an expectation of it ending a certain way and it doesn't it ends up in a very different way but that difference is not so great that it frightens us it just simply makes us laugh now spencer writing sort of throughout the, the 1800s or during the 19th century his model was not exactly the, the most up-to-date, I mean, up-to-date at that point, because uh, he was still part of this, the leftover in the scientific world of using mechanical models. Uh, you can find that even as far back as the 1600s, but for about 200 years, uh, mechanical and hydraulic models were often used to describe things. So this mechanical model of, you know, pressure being built up uh, and being released instead of, you know, a steam whistle, it's laughter. It's kind of antiquated. It's it's old fashioned, right? That's that's what it means. So, the model he presents to us, as much as the idea may be sound, uh, the model that he uses is somewhat old fashioned. Uh, the second one is that these biological references are kind of misguided. Uh, there are some jokes that are very short. Some jokes that don't even build up a a, a sense of narrative. Um, so it it's not applicable all the time. And the notion of lowered uh, expectations, right, seems to work only in one direction, because what if the opposite happened? What if we expected something that was trivial uh, to, to end the story turns out to be something horrifying? Well, then clearly we are going to be 
filled with shock and horror. So this is what I mean by that sliding scale. That slight deviation, funny. Great deviation, much more, uh, much more concerning. So the lowered expectations uh, is only going to work in one direction. That what we see ends up being trivial and silly and kind of really out there. And again, I cannot think of a better clip than Monty Python's The Black Knight sequence from the Holy Grail. And here, when you watch it, uh, think of expectation that is thwarted by incongruity. Like the punchline is is the 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 scene continuing on and on. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it before. If you haven't, uh, <laughs> you'll be in hopefully for a laugh uh, because what you what should be disconcerting to us ends up being so ridiculous that we just start laughing. And that lowered expectation is exactly what Herbert sent, uh, Herbert Spencer is talking about. So. The way in which a, a great concern that we have for the Black Knight suddenly goes out the window and we're laughing because of, of his reaction. So that's kind of what's going on with the Black Knight. If you were to try to explain it to somebody, because to describe it is <laughs> rather horrific, but it's just the way it's presented, the way it works on building up absurdity upon absurdity. But by doing that, it deflates that expectation. It deflates that, uh, um, the kind of buildup that we had had, that great concern that we have. So take a look at it and we'll see you back in a minute. Okay. So let's continue on with uh, Spencer and, uh, these, the relief theories that we see Spencer and then, uh, Freud that we'll see in just a moment. This idea of the mechanical or hydraulic, you know, formulation or mo model that we have, uh, of the human mind is at times kind of difficult to prove let's say let's say it's more of a of, of a fiction it's a fiction about what we think is is going on um our our heads don't fill up with steam right we don't have a steam whistle at the top of our heads it's just it's a model that's all it is so um let's say it's just metaphorical uh because really all we want to think about is well what could it be like what is a comparative you know model and that's really all we need to think about the notion of relief here is simply the expenditure of concern or expectation is thwarted by a punchline, thwarted by something that we expected to occur, but was deviated just enough to, to make it funny. And all of this, all of this we're talking about has to do and is based upon this idea of anticipation, right? We're expecting something to conclude in a certain way based on what we know of the first two parts of the joke. But rather than being concerned or frightened or horrified, right, that unexpected punchline instead leads to laughter. So it has to be built upon anticipation. Uh, there are some comedians, for example, uh, an American comedian that was probably more popular in the, said in the 80s, um, Steve, Stephen Wright. Uh, his his whole model for performing is one-liners, literally one-liners. And they're very absurd, most of the time very funny. But again, how do you talk about expectation when the joke is literally built around one single sentence? So anticipation, maybe not so much as uh, expectation of what is the norm. And that's what makes Steve Wright's jokes as funny as they are, because they literally defy every form of logic and reason and rationality. But sometimes, as I say, there are literally one sentence long. So anticipation here, it might be more concerned with uh, expectation based on the norms that we have of our behavior. Now, all of this should sound for fairly familiar to what Kant had mentioned last week. La laughter is an affection from sudden transformation of a strained expectation into nothing. So what is happening is we are thinking about what might occur and it is literally dissolved away into nothing suddenly that great sort of fear that we may have had just deflates literally deflates so in the way that steam might be uh sort of siphoned off to maintain pressure or lower pressure that lowering of the pr of the pressure within us you know in our mind is uh is the sound of laughter okay so uh as i mentioned some jokes are one-liners uh there's no sense of anticipation uh, but what we are really thinking about is we have a an assumption based on reason, logic, you know, the laws of gravity, <laughs> the laws of nature, even uh, expectation. And even a one line, the one liner joke 
can still be built on some kind of uh, expectation. Uh, but really what happens at the end is that that feeling of sudden lightness because we're laughing and laughing releases pressure no matter what. Uh, and so that's really what we need to think about. So whether the joke is one line, it's a three part joke, it's a story, it's whatever. What matters here is where we end up. Where we end up is possessing that quality of lightness because the joke makes us feel good. We laughter makes us feel good. Now, speaking of laughter, uh, some people don't like uh, laughing at offensive humor. So this is the short clip uh, by John Cleese, about a minute and a half or so, uh, talking about relief theory, but in a sense of what certain people are willing to laugh about and the fact that it is possible to laugh at taboo subjects, but this is not an, an assumption we can make on behalf of everyone. Some people, regardless of the joke, the format of humor and laughter, still find certain things offensive. So John Cleese talking about offensive humor uh, and exactly why that is that it it seems to offend certain people and not, not others. So have a look at that and we'll see you back in a minute. Okay, so now we are on to Sigmund Freud, uh, this gentleman here, there we go, from this book. Uh, Freud kind of built on Spencer's relief uh, theory of humor and came up with an even more a uh, complex model, uh, but essentially saying the same thing. When I say complex, he broke the mind up into uh, id, ego, and superego, but this is not a psych lesson, it's humor. But that's basically what the human psyche is. It's broken down in these three parts. And for Freud, laughter helps us release that psychic energy that we would use to hold down these sort of uh, taboo thoughts, for, for example, especially relating to sexuality and behavior. So, that's what Freud believed uh, humor was able to do, was to siphon off some of that psychic energy that we used to hold back these thoughts that we have, you know, about our behavior, or others, but mostly about sexuality. Because he is writing during the Victorian era, so there's of great concern to them. So um, there's a whole range of causes for laughter, and all of them, depending on how easily we can uh, manipulate our psychic energy, there's some people that are afraid to sort of to let go and don't want to hear offensive humor because it suddenly might them it might get them thinking about you know other things and so depending on how healthy we are psychically speaking we should and we can allow that psychic energy to some sometimes build up build up and get released through humor so what freud is saying is being able to do that is actually healthy right it's a sign of of a sexual health and mental health to be able to laugh at jokes for what they are and not get so offended that you literally, like you, you fall apart. You end up having a panic attack or an anxiety attack. And that's not, that's not the, the role of humor. The role of humor is to, is to allow that psychic energy to be regulated, to be able to, to flow in different directions. So as I've mentioned several times, mostly topics regarding to human sexuality are the kinds of topics that require more psychic energy to maintain. He calls that repression. And so if we can repress some of these feelings, and it is important that we do, otherwise it would be rather chaotic outside in the in the real world, um, those topics that center around human sexuality are typically the topics that get suppressed because we don't talk about these kinds of things in you know mixed company or out loud, we shouldn't. And so Freud says if we can do that, that's one thing. But if we can let that lid open up Temp, you know, periodically, that is not a bad thing either. So, uh, the uh, full passage. Whoops, sorry. The full full passage in here, on uh, page two ninety three. I'll just read it here, and then I'll I'll pick up with what's there. So we have seen that the release of distressing affects is the greatest obstacle to the emergence of the comic. In other words, people who are easily offended. As soon as the aimless movement does damage, or the stupidity leads to, leads to mischief, or the disappointment causes pain the possibility of a comic effect is at an end. So that has to do with that sliding scale I keep talking about, that a small deviation, humorous, a great deviation, great concern. So if we can identify that it's just simply the release of that psychic energy and the taboo subject is now put away, we should be okay. So this is true at all events for a person who cannot ward off such unpleasure, who is himself its victim or is obliged to have a share in it. 
whereas a person who is not concerned shows by his demeanor that the situation involved contains everything that is required for the comic effect. Now, humor is a means of obtaining pleasure in spite of the distressing effects that interfere with it. So a healthy person recognizes that it is a taboo subject, recognizes that this is not something we can talk about in mixed company or in front of our parents or some, something like that, recognizes it for what it is, but still allows the joke to unfold and reach its conclusion and is then able to sort of put the lid back down and carry on with her day. So now humor is a mean of, uh, okay, as I said, uh, it acts as a substitute for the generation of these affects. It puts itself in their place. So we vicariously think about these things. We vicariously think about sexual matters in the form of a joke. And then we uh, recognize it for what it is and we move on. So the conditions for appearance are given if there is a situation in which according to our usual habits, we should be tempted to release a distressing effect. And if motives then operate upon us, which release that effect uh, in its, in its uh, uh, formative state. In the cases we have just mentioned, the person who is the victim of the injury, pain and so on, might obtain humorous pleasure while the unconcerned person laughs for comic pleasure. The pleasure of humor, if this is so, comes about, we cannot say otherwise, at the cost of a release of effect that does not occur, it arises from an economy in the expenditure of affect. Now, in no regular language, because that's, that's psychoanalytic language, but what's happening here is the pleasure of the humor comes from the release that it gives us. We recognize that it is taboo, that we shouldn't maybe laugh at another person's pain, because now we're getting back to superiority theory. But what Freud says is, because we recognize that it is a joking matter, we look, we view it differently. We still recognize, recognize it, uh, that it's taboo and certain feelings we have towards things and objects and people and so on are not, you know, they may be antisocial, they could be bordering on violence or criminal, but temporarily we entertain this idea. And so we laugh at it and then we put it away. We put it back in that little cupboard called the unconscious and we put the lid back on. So jokes allow us to vicariously think about these particular things. Now, with that long-winded introduction in mind, uh, this is one of two of my, my favorite Keen Peel clips. Uh, so think about what we just talked about. Humor is a means of obtaining pleasure in spite of the distressing effects that interfere with it. It acts as a substitute for the generation of these affects. It puts itself in their place. So what's happening here is we have Key and Peele uh, that go to, to, well, one visits the other, and they're talking to each other. And, of course, one is trying to tell the other, and, of course, it goes back and forth, that, you know, he's he's putting his his wife kind of in her place and saying, look, you know, we, we got to do this, we got to do that. And, of course, ends up with, with the line, I said, bitch. And it's how they say it. They know what they're saying is taboo. They know that they're saying something that will get them into trouble. It's how they say it, the context in which they say it, the look they give at each other and they're looking around. Therein lies the humor. We, we vicariously recognize what they're doing is wrong, but we still watch it because we just see like, how far are they going to take this? Because they're not exactly being nice to, you know, speaking about their wives, but we're watching it and we're kind of, we're, we are put in their place. We imagine what it must be like because we know that they're not really saying that to their wives, but the one is trying to convince the other that, oh yeah, absolutely. But is, is the length to which they go to be able to say these particular things. So we are laughing at something that is distressing because it acts, first of all, as a substitute. We imagine it happening, but it is not happening to us directly. And when it's over, we walk away. So have a look at that and don't walk away. Please do come back and we'll talk some more. Okay. So what's going on now with uh, the idea of relief theory? And Freud posits three different things. The first is that laughter created by jokes that address taboo subjects uh, constitute a release of energy that would otherwise be used to repress that thought in the first place. So the energy to hold something down is now the ener energy that's used to release it, right? So that psychic energy is at work in the mind, but it's working now in two different directions. And Freud believes that that is healthy. So if we're always spending our time repressing something and we, we go out of our way to repress, in this case, it could be a, a really bad memory. I mean, a childhood trauma. So repression here 
that is a very dangerous thing because you don't want to release it at all because you know it's going to cause you great harm, you know, mentally speaking. So if we have a healthy mind, a healthy, you know, psyche, we can lift that lid regularly and close it back down again. So typically it is to repress taboo thoughts, but if we are mentally healthy, we can release these taboo thoughts periodically before putting them back down or at least back into our unconscious. That's the first one. The second one is that laughter occurs when comedy provides a kind of escape from rational thoughts. These are all the things that we are expected to do as adults. I mean, as, as young adults, you know, even as, uh, you know, you turn 10, 11, 12, already you start your, the expectations by your parents is for you to act in a certain way. And it just, it, over time takes our toll, right? We really are spending a lot of time thinking rationally, reasonably, logically. We think about all these social norms and we want to make sure we're doing the right thing. We're not going to get laughed at. That's a lot of psychic energy. And so when we, we become too concerned with, you know, the demands of rational thought, we don't want to, we don't, we end up getting rigid, like Bergson says, right? Rigid rather than flexible. So we need to be flexible, right? We need to be able to open and close that lid that holds those taboo thoughts in place. So if, <clears throat> if we can get into that irrational part of our brain, uh, it can be enjoyable. We don't want to live there forever, but we can think of irrational things. Taboo jokes, for example, they allow the freedom temporarily from the constraints that reason places upon these ideas. And that's really what he's saying. And then finally, the release of energy uh, caused by things that are that are serious, that turn out to be trivial. Uh, the Black Knight uh, skit that we just saw kind of works that way a little bit. Something that I mean, losing your arm is pretty serious, but it is the, re the reaction of the Black Knight. You know, tis only a flesh wound, and then off he goes, it's still fighting. So that lowered expectation is very quickly there, and it just goes downhill from there. So uh, the notion of lowered expectations, the notion that the 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 end of the story turns out to be trivial rather than serious, therein lies the source of the joke. Um, this next uh, clip, and I wanted to use the one with the swear words, so I apologize ahead of time. There's a few F-bombs in there, but it's got a killer punchline at the end. So do follow it all the way through and think again of this idea that the release of energy that's caused, in this case, by a situation, a text mes message confusion. Now, the reason why this clip is funny is because we see what both parties are, are doing and hearing and reading back. So both Key and Peel, we get to see what each one of them is doing, and therein lies the humor. So we are watching it. We are seeing the two of them. I mean, one very chilled and relaxed, the other going completely berserk. And of course, we look at that as a lowered expectation. Like, why is this guy just going completely off on, on his friend? But therein lies the humor, right? We would expect people to be somewhat reasonable, but this character isn't. Therein lies part, part of the humor. But as it builds up and builds up and builds up, we finally get the punchline. And the punchline is, in a sense, a lowered expectation. So it is, uh, again, like I say, along with uh, the first one you saw, uh, text message confusion is one of my favorite Key and Peele uh, clips. But it really shows how something as trivial as a misunderstanding can explode into full-on rage and ready to kill somebody. And then, boom, it, it ends in a certain way with this lowered expectation. I'm not going to ruin it if you haven't seen it, because, but do, do check it out right to the end. But really watch, especially towards the tail end when there's a bit too much mumbling going on, but it's a great punchline. Okay, so Freud talks about our ability to deal with uh, taboo subjects. But remember what John Cleese said about offensive material, that there is a different be difference between innocent jokes and controversial jokes. Not everyone will be able to have that capacity to deal with taboo subjects, and some of them still are, right? They still are difficult to make, to make fun of uh, because they are serious or they are sad or they cause grief or they're tragic, whatever. Um, but we even have, you know, 9-11 jokes. They're, they're out there. So there is a distinction between innocent and controversial, controversial jokes. And so uh, what Freud says is really important because the joke is the framework. It is the kind of temporary setting aside of a taboo subject, or at least the relationship we should have with that taboo subject. We set that aside. 
and we look at it simply for what it is. And therein lies the fact that it can be controversial. But some people, just like I say, it's just, it's not something they're comfortable with. So it doesn't work with just anyone. Uh, but Freud's distinction between these two is really important because when this is happening, jokes should lower the inhibitions and the jokers, you know, who are telling these taboo, uh, these taboo jokes, um, we know that what is happening is not going to change anything. We are identifying what it is. We're kind of having fun with it. We're kind of, you know, turning on its head and thinking of different things. But we are also aware that it is a taboo subject. It is the fact that we are discussing it within the confines of comedy or humor that we can even talk about these things in the first place. Because normally, there would be things that you wouldn't want to talk about in sort of, again, in mixed a company. So we see this going on in uh, a lot of uh, ideas that Freud has in identifying the taboo subject. The, the, the speaker and the listener or the person telling the joke, the one listening, we're both aware. Both parties are aware that this is taboo material. And so taboo feelings uh, usually repressed into the, the unconscious part of the mind where they typically should should remain because we don't want to be blurting things out in front of people. We want to have that filter, right? That filter should be working. So what does repression do? Repression holds down those taboo feelings, uh, you know, of inflicting violence on someone or... Um, Worst case scenario, something like a rape fantasy. I mean, that's what they are. They're fantasies, but those are, you know, horrifying forms of behavior. So to make a rape joke, like it better be good because nobody wants to hear it. And Freud knew that there were some, you know, difficult, uh, topics that simply were not, uh, not warrant of humor because they are so serious. Now, if that is the case, repression holds back these ideas. Uh, when we allow these topics into our conscious mind, right, the conscious mind that things that we think about every single day, uh, we don't need that repression. We don't need that repressive energy. And we recognize it for what it is, and more importantly, the context in which we experience it. That's really what's important. Because if that's the case, when we're talking about certain things, um, the context of stand-up comedy is that is comedy. We're in a, in a nightclub or in a stand-up uh, comedy club. We expect people sometimes to talk about taboo subjects because comedians are going to try you know, material and try to talk about different things. And some jokes are going to fall flat. Some of them will be offensive. There's going to be lots of groaners. And sometimes there's going to be a couple of really good ones, a few really good zingers. But as we're doing this, as we are listening and processing the information, and even if we're discussing taboo subjects, we're allowing those topics into our conscious mind and we're comparing what's being discussed with what we consider to be social norms, um, you know, criminal and anti-criminal behavior, um, the, you know, the various laws of nature that, that we believe in. We are now holding those two thoughts in our heads and whatever that leftover energy that is that we have, uh, because we're not frightened by it, we know it's the confines of a joke, then that in, therein lies what we consider to be funny. Um, this next clip here by uh, comedian Josh Wolf, uh, although it's called Dick Picks, there aren't any, thankfully. But again, this is what I mean when I talk about uh, the psychic energy to censor certain thoughts. If we allow those thoughts into our conscious mind and we consider, you know, what is appropriate behavior, um, it makes this routine rather funny. And it, it, it is, and I don't think there's any F-bombs in this one, I'm pretty sure, but it's talking about something that is embarrassing, uh, something that should be considered taboo and typically is, uh, but it's what Josh Wolf does with it and plays with the audience's nervousness about the, the topic. Uh, well done, but an awareness that, you know, this topic is something that is otherwise taboo, but within the confines of a standup routine is actually quite funny. And especially the different characters that he plays, both himself and his son. So quite funny. Have a look at it and, uh, consider this idea of, you know, holding down thoughts that are, that are, uh, that are considered taboo, now thinking about behavior and what is versus what should be. So see you back in a minute. Okay, so we're going to continue now with uh, Freud um, and the pleasure that is sort of inherent in a joke. There is the release of inhibitions. We are now releasing inhibitions and we're thinking about taboo subjects in our conscious mind uh, and we recognize them still as what they are. We know that they are 
These are topics that typically are repressed, but we're allowed within the confines of a joke to talk about them. So there's a release of in inhibitions, right? We talk about things that we don't normally talk about. There's a release of the mechanism that represses th certain ideas. I mean, I, I, I imagine the idea of putting a lid on something. It's not a very good metaphor, but it's one that's going to work in the sense that you understand that repression does that. It represses and holds down into the unconscious certain minds, uh, certain ideas that uh, that we shouldn't be, you know, sh shouldn't be discussing. We know about them, but they're not things that we would like to have, you know, through a slip of the tongue or a, what's called a Freudian slip, right? Exactly that, that uh, we don't want to say out loud, but we can still think about it. So certain ideas, a group of ideas, you know, parts of the body, whatever, uh, these are things that we try to hold down. But what's happening in the joke is we temporarily release that mechanism that holds those ideas in place, allows them to exist in the conscious mind. We do that little comparison between what is and what should be. And if the joke is a good one and not offensive to us, then that feeling of lightness, right, that accompanies the release of that repression and that sort of that acknowledgement of what's just happened, that laughter is that feeling of lightness that we call the relief theory of, of humor. So that's really kind of about it. Um, there are some problems, like there was with Spencer. There are problems with Freud's uh, theory as well. Um, the idea of a difference between innocent jokes and rude jokes is an, a matter of interpretation. Uh, John Cleese, right? In offensive jokes. There are some people that, because they find something offensive, or maybe if they can't control their own emotions, they get really busy controlling everyone else's. So innocent jokes versus rude jokes, it's a matter of interpretation. Some people find lots of different things uh, very offensive, while other people don't, and vice versa. Uh, taboo jokes are not always necessarily funnier than innocent jokes, right? Just because they're taboo doesn't make them extra funny. Uh, as uh, Ricky Gervais mentioned to us last week, uh, if you're going to deal with those things, you better, you better be good, it better be funny, and you better be on the right side of history. So there's a lot at stake in dealing with taboo subjects. And also to the fact that Freud's model is um, kind of mechanical and hydraulic. Uh, we can't sort of take a mind apart and identify the conscious versus the subconscious and the pre-conscious and the id and all these kinds of things. Uh, those things are simply models. So this model of psychic energy, this kind of hydraulic mechanical model, again, it's unprovable and somewhat antiquated because, again, Freud was writing uh, on the cusp of the so switching from the 18th century, uh, 1800s to the 1900s and was still sort of feeling the remnants of this kind of scientific view of everything that happening within the body is this some kind of this mechanical or hydraulic version of things. And that goes all the way back to Descartes writing in the 1600s. Okay, so what's going on here when we're talking about taboo subjects, uh, controversial jokes, taboo jokes, whatever? What we need is an audience, right, to validate the joke. And the audience become complicit by playing with the social norms, right? In other words, thinking about what should be versus what's being discussed. And by doing that and responding with laughter legitimates the joke to the teller. So the person telling the joke feels okay discussing it because he's now, he or she is rewarded with laughter. So the audience really is the one that validates the taboo joke. If it falls flat and people start yelling and, you know, stone silence, just the sound of crickets, nothing else. No, it's not funny. It's deviated either too far or it's just plain rude and offensive and there's really no comedic material in it. So as we are listening to controversial jokes, we're still comparing and measuring what is the social norm, the expectation, the tradition, right? The anticipation, all these things are going on. And if it works and we are satisfied by the conclusion or the punchline, then we laugh. We think it's very funny. Now, this is something that I want you to consider both now and throughout the second half of the course is the following. When we were talking about humor and we're talking about the morality of, of controversial jokes, we have to take into account who tells the joke, in which context, and with what intention. Those three things are very, very important because depending on who is telling the joke, uh, we need to consider, you know, are they, are they sort of, uh, are they speaking from experience? 
Are they are they talking truth to power? Are they sort of you know turning um, traditions and stereotypes on their head because of who they are? So taking into account who tells a joke, in what context, and for what intention is very very important for us to consider, especially as we start talking about morality uh, and postmodernism and the way in which humor is really getting pushed to its limits in this postmodern world that we live in. So keep that in mind because we will go back to it. So ultimately, for Freud and for others who believe the relief theory, the pleasure of humor lies in the ability to overturn re uh, rationality, to turn that, that rational world that we spend a lot of psychic energy creating and maintaining in our heads, uh, even if it doesn't always match up, uh, we overturn that temporarily, right? And we get in touch with our inner child. Um, There's something that as adults, we know we, we forget about, we lose. And that irrational world of nonsense and absurdity and just general goofiness, um, we don't tend to be super goofy, you know, at, at work. Um, but we will if we're working with people that we feel comfortable with, you know, and it passes the time, it relieves boredom, and you can kind of joke around a little bit, again, not the degree that you get someone into trouble or you, you know, self-harm or something, but you just deal with nonsense and absurdity and just silly things, things, things also that are inclusive, right, that you all share, uh, a boss that you don't like or a particular worker that everyone just seems to hate and eh, you can maybe talk behind their back, but again, be careful uh, because you're in a work environment. But the point here is the pleasures of childhood and that association with, with just goofy behavior, silly, irrational behavior. This is something that as adults, we lose sight of. And humor sometimes al allows us to reconnect with that 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 world that we've you know we've left behind as we've now reached adulthood so we get that temporary relief from the demands of adulthood which is not a bad thing and freud again said that if we can do this we are mentally healthy in other words we can lift the lid and allow unconscious thoughts to come out because those unconscious thoughts can be put back in now someone that is repressing a childhood trauma uh, of any kind of humiliation of, you know, some sexual matter, they cannot lift that lid as easily because it, the fear is that it's going to release something that is they've spent their lifetime holding back and repressing uh, to the point almost of neurotic behavior. So neuroses come from that, that excessive amount of work the, of holding down that lid on something that you just don't want to think about. And what Freud was saying was if we can bring this out into the open and we can deal with that event, that issue, that moment, that whatever it is that causes that neurosis, and we can and we can discuss it as it really is and, and kind of hold it up in the, to the light of day, in other words, in the conscious mind, then there will be that purging, right? That purging of all that repression, and then you're able to at least deal with it. So catharsis is something that is still very important in psychoanalysis because it's the same kind of thing. It's a kind of purification and a purging of these ill feelings. And the ill feelings, of course, is all those awful things that may have occurred that you've spent a lifetime holding back and it pops out here and there because that lid is never completely tight. And how these things kind of pop out will really dictate what kind of neurotic reaction you have. So if we can open that lid in a healthy kind of way, we are considered by Freud to be mentally healthy and we can still reconnect with our childhood and we can relieve ourselves of that, you know, the rationality of adulthood. Now, again, it doesn't work for everyone. Those that have had, you know, mental trauma or, or sexual trauma as children uh, have a much harder time doing this kind of thing. And Freud recognizes that as well. So he says, you know, it is something that is not available to everyone. Depending on what your childhood was like, it may be more or less difficult to do. But being able to lift that lid is, is considered to be something that is healthy. So that's what I want to sort of clear uh, clear up. So he says, through joking, we regain, we regain from mental activity a pleasure which has in fact been lost through the development of that activity, of mental activity, rationality, reason, logic, all these kinds of things. So joking serves a useful purpose because such relief keeps us psychologically healthy. But not all people can do it. And this is ultimately what is really sad and tragic because 
There are things that, that occur to individuals at a young age, and you don't have to be at a young age. It occurred to you at some point, right? Let's be clear. And you spend a lot of time holding back and repressing this idea because it's painful. And Freud recognizes that. But if you don't have that kind of a childhood or that kind of a life, you can tap into that unconscious and pull out these various things, which would be otherwise taboo or, or controversial and temporarily think about them, right? And vicariously think about them. Now, this next clip here, um, I know Daniel Tosh has uh, gotten into trouble over the last probably 10 years saying uh, sort of unfunny things. But this is a kind of an early clip uh, stand up doing uh, or doing stand up in 2001. And I want you to think about this idea of overturning rationality. Um, the pleasure of childhood that adults lose as they mature, the irrational world of nonsense and absurdity. This early clip, I think, is is Tosh not doing this thing that he ended up doing of just, I don't know, almost actively offending people. But this is genuinely funny. Uh, so whatever thought you have of Daniel, Daniel Tosh now, this was back when he was l less obnoxious. Uh, and he just kind of talks about things that are mildly taboo because he's talking about homelessness, but is how he does it and the kinds of images that he uses. And again, just using words. Now, some gestures, of course. But the kind of humorous, irrational, absurd behavior that he associates with uh, musicians, the homeless, and so on, uh, have fun with it. It's a short clip, about three minutes. But it is, to me, a good example of reconnecting with just silly, crazy, you know, zany behavior that adults typically don't do, but certainly kids would do. But Tosh says, you know, what if we did this as adults? What it would look like? So take a look at that, and we'll see you back in a moment. Now, the last person we're going to talk about is uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, who is the author of this book right here, Rabelais in This World and many others. Um, Bakhtin took Freud's idea of temporary release of psychic energy, and he brought it to almost a social level. So he looked at Freud's ideas, uh, his interest in the relationship between humor and authority, because Freud had this interesting idea take it or leave it, but he had this idea of the ego and the superego. The superego being uh, the internalization of authority figures. And as kids, when we grow up, our first authority figures that we encounter are our parents. Our parents tell us, you know, to not do bad things and to certainly continue doing good things. But we eventually internalize that voice of our parents. Uh, and we sometimes, and we should, stop ourselves from doing bad things. And that superego is that voice of authority that tells us, you know, you shouldn't do that. You can call it your conscience, for example. But that voice of authority is that voice you hear telling you, you know, I, I wouldn't do that. You know, that's not, this is not a good idea. So think of it that way, the ego and the superego, superego authority, kind of the, the voice of authority, the ego, which is us. Um, it's in fact, in French is le moi, right? The I. Um, and so, Think of that, the relationship between humor and authority, because what Freud's been talking about is, is a temporary absence of an authority figure saying, you can't talk about these taboo subjects, right? You can't talk about these, these controversial things. And yet we are, right? But we still recognize them as controversial, but we do it in the confines of a joke. So here we have a relationship between humor and authority. And what Bakhtin does is he expands it to not the individual, but the society in which an individual exists. Now, in this case, humor, right, doesn't threaten the status quo. It doesn't, in other words, it doesn't threaten the, the authority, but it actually kind of reestablishes and maintains it. And so in that sense, he's much like Freud. We don't turn around and think about a taboo subject and then go out and act on it. We laugh and we move on, right? We laugh and the joke's over. So Bakhtin applies the same idea to society and he says, you know, that social safety valve is in fact very healthy. And so we should be allowed to kind of uh, vicariously do certain things at a certain time. And then because we can, we can do it, then we look forward to the time in which we can do it. It actually keeps us sane. It keeps us socially healthy. So humor in this case doesn't threaten authority or you know, the social fabric because it's built right in. It's built right into the social fabric. So in a sense, it actually maintains it. Now, um, this particular clip I'm going to show first, and then I'm going to talk about it. And this is uh, this idea uh, of humor and authority. 
Now, authority figures can come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. In this particular case, it's Donald Trump. I know he's kind of out of the news, but he isn't. Uh, certainly not this weekend. He still is. And thinking about um, the relationship between humor and authority figures and how we can laugh at these people, which remember, laughing is the, is the worst thing you can do to, to a person like that, especially a thin skinned narcissist like Trump, um, you know, to be laughed at, which is he, he loses his mind. Now, the joke in this particular little cartoon runs about a minute and a half, doesn't destroy him. He was still in power after the joke was presented. We still laughed at him. But then when the joke was over, we just went about our day. So it doesn't threaten the status quo, but in fact simply reestablishes and maintains it because at this point, Trump was still a, a figure of authority. We laughed at him, but it was just the fact that we were given that temporary release to laugh at an authority figure, not something we typically can do, but we do it. But nothing really happens to the authority. They, they still continue there. So have a look at that and we'll see you back in just a moment. Okay, so as I mentioned, this book right here, there you go, uh, in Rabelais' world, uh, Bactine comes up with this really interesting idea of the carnival and behavior within the carnival, which is what he called the carnivalesque, right? A kind, a kind of carnival-ish behavior. Uh, this is this is an idea that really traveled well out of, um, I think he wrote it uh, 1932, 34, uh, living in Russia at that point of sort of the Soviet Union. Um, and this idea of the carnivalesque has become very influential in film studies. Uh, literary uh, critics have used it a lot. And it actually comes from the medieval carnivals, like the Feast of Fools. Uh, this is something we're going to talk about when we get back after the midterm uh, and we talk about humor and religion. So the Feast of Fools was one of them. Uh, and what this is, it's a period of revelry and excess that takes place before Lent. So there is a time designated by society. Of course, at this point, um, the Feast of Fools and many of these ideas uh, are occurring in Western and Eastern Europe around, let's say, between, let's say, the 1200s to maybe about the 1600s. So about a 300 year period where society was basically ruled over by the church. But the church, rather than for some reason, we now believe that the church thinks, thinks that we should work seven days a week. The church was all about resting, especially on a Sunday. And the church built into the calendar, the yearly calendar, a series of different uh, times. It could be a weekend, it could be a week where individuals were allowed to not work. And during the Feast of Fools or during the Carnival, there was a period that was set aside, clearly demarcated. It's going to last one week. It's going to start this day and then that day. And it is a free for all. Drink all you want, fornicate all you want, you know, eat all you want and do all kinds of crazy things. But after sa Saturday, it's over. And typically the craziest ones were just before Lent. Now, those of you that are Catholic will know the period of Lent, which is just before Easter or the Easter time. And during Lent, you're supposed to eat a lot less, uh, atone for your sins, think about the passion of, of Christ and the suffering on the cross and so on. It's, it's a serious time. But immediately before Lent was a time of just organized chaos. Literally, that's what it was. So the carnival and that carnivalesque behavior was that period of revelry in excess, too much drinking and fornicating and eating and everything else. And just, it was, it was literally a free for all. So we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. Ultimately, carnivalesque behavior or carnival behavior was behavior that would be socially unacceptable under any other conditions. So what we just saw with the Donald Trump clip is a good example of carnivalesque humor. Donald Trump is sitting on his toilet. Think about that. He's sitting on his toilet. That's just not something we would, you know, typically think about authority figures doing. We know they do. They, they're all born with a backside, so we got to use a toilet. But the fact that that is part of the humor, we are mocking these figures, right? And it doesn't matter who they are. And of course, during the, the carnival period uh, between the 1200s and the 1600s, those dignitary, uh, dignitaries, I should say, but it often include members of the church. 
Uh, the monarchy could also be made fun of. Uh, this clip here, which is taken from a parade in Germany, um, the Weidhof Erhoffnung means opening soon, right? That's Uncle Sam. So, and the latter leading up to his backside. This is the kind of humor that was associated with carnivalesque behavior. It was basically uh, peasants who were otherwise, you know, having a horrible day, horrible life. They had a chance to mock those figures of authority. They could let off steam, just like Spencer and Freud talked about. They were able to let off steam. So uh, social codes, <clears throat> social conventions, uh, you know, laws, criminal or otherwise, are all temporarily suspended. Authority figures take the week off, right? They're gone. And so what is happening is the traditional hierarchy, the social hierarchy of peasant at the bottom, you know, Everybody in the, a bunch of people in the middle that are, you know, earls and dukes and so on. And at the top, you've got the bishops and the kings. That whole world is literally turned upside down. And the peasant is in charge. The peasant calls the shots. And of course, it makes you feel good. You let off some steam and it's purging. It purges those feelings of, you know, the next time I see that guy, I think I'm going to tear his head off. Or I think we should plan a revolt. Well, it releases and purges those feelings of antisocial behavior or criminal behavior or even revolutionary behavior. So it turns that hierarchy that otherwise it may not be the best in the world, but it was what it, what it was at the time turned upside down. But again, always within the confines of a particular time and space. Now, um, we can see all kinds of humor that is associated with uh, religion, which again is a kind of taboo subject. It is for many, many people, uh, those certainly uh, believers. Uh, this is a picture of Da Vinci painted in 1498 of the Last Supper uh, during the sort of just the beginning of the Renaissance period. Very famous pa painting uh, with, you know, perspective with Christ right in the middle of the picture. Um, it is the typical Renaissance painting of Christ and the, the apostles. Now we have this picture by Louis Benuel, his film Verdiana, made in 1961. And that picture looks really similar but these are uh, alcoholics, homeless, um, perverts and deviants of one sort or another, and just basically not exactly the cream of the crop. <laughs> we'll say that much. Um, what Benuel is doing is taking an idea associated with being sacred and holy and literally turning it on its head, turning it around and saying, OK, we have the most motley crew of peasants and drunks and loafers and, and thieves and so on celebrating what looks like a Last Supper. So that will be a carnivalesque moment. That is, that social hierarchy literally turned upside down. So the carnival, uh, as we saw with the Donald Trump uh, clip, it's, it is characterized by grotesquery and grotesque bodies, uh, scatology, uh, kinds of, you know, toilet humor, which is what we call it typically because scatology, no one knows what that means. Uh, but it is certainly not in favor of reason and rationality. It is very much in, in favor of uh, a kind of anti-intellectualism. So there's an emphasis on the lower body. Of course, where, where are the sexual organs? In the lower body. Where is the mind? Up here, not important, right? Again, authority figures take the week off. So it's a kind of, it's a kind of humor that works against uh, any kind of notion of authority, which includes reason taste, norms, correct forms of behavior, piety, all these things are literally turned upside down. There is now a focus, right? A, 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 uh, a preoccupation, we'll say, with the lower bodily extremities. The picture we saw of Uncle, Uncle Sam bend over with his pants down, right? That is a grotesque image, but it is a carnivalesque image because it is now focusing not on the upper half, right, which is eyes and the sight, the mind, the heart, all the good things that Plato would have talked about. No, we're talking about the lower extremities, you know, where we go to the bathroom and we pee and we procreate with our sexual organs. That's what it's all about. So carnival humor is believed to belong to the people, those that typically don't have power to really make things different. So humor belongs to the people, the people that, um, the ones that, would typically rebel against the, the powers that be, but don't because they know that the power and the authority that is there could very likely kill them. So it is a way to vicariously let off steam without 
being, uh, you know, being harmed as a result of it. Okay, so carnival ask or uh, the carnival, the grotesque, uh, toilet humor, anti intellectualism, emphasis on the lower body, and so on. It throws out all notions of authority. Uh, the Marx Brothers, one of my favorites. Uh, this is the short clip. You could pick almost anything out of the Marx Brothers, especially anything with Harpo, the, the one who doesn't say anything. Um, this is a clip from a movie called Duck Soup, uh, made in 1933. And it is an anti-war film, first of all. Uh, and it's made, um, it was made actually, it was probably a, a bunch of routines that they were doing on stage on vaudeville, which it kind of cribbed together and made a movie with some semblance of a narrative. But this is the clip where, um, Chico and Harpo play these two spies, the, uh, Ciccolini brothers, and they don't look anything the same, but that's part of the joke. But watch, especially Harpo, the silent one, the one wearing the hat. Think of, the the uh, grotesque body think of the emphasis on the lower body think also about the complete jettisoning of reason and taste and norms and piety he is this impish little satyr because we talked about satyrs a, a few weeks ago he is he is a, a, just this little imp that does whatever he wants uh he you can't hold him back he just it seems to be all over the place carrying the weirdest things in his pockets anyway it's about two minutes long but it gives you kind of a flavor of what the, the carnivalesque idea of, you know, this, this, uh, throwing out authority, focus on the lower body, focus on irrationality. It's a good example of that. So take a look at that. And then we're just going to wrap up with our last couple of slides. Okay. So we have here this relationship between Freud and Bakhtin being, uh, quite similar. Uh, Freud's idea of humor as a psychic safety valve which is it's a safety valve that is healthy for individuals. Bakhtin's theory applies that to society. So in the same way as Freud talks about an individual psychic safety valve, Bakhtin talks about a social safety valve. And it is truly a safety valve because it reconstitutes society. We go completely crazy for a weekend or a week or whatever, and then everything goes all back to normal. Right now, the only thing I can think of that is even close to a carnival moment uh, that is de designated in society is Halloween night. When you think about it, the world's turned upside down. Little kids can stay up late. Little kids go door to door. It's something that you would never ask them to do otherwise, you know, because they'll be, care be, be weary of strangers. They go door to door to strangers and ask for candy. <laughs> it's like, think about that. And adults can now dress up. You can dress up on whatever character you like to be. Men can dress up as women, women as men, or whatever. So it is a momentary turning upside down of reason and rationality. Uh, people can wear sexy outfits. I don't know if sexy nurse and sexy whatever is still in. It's kind of on the way out. But certainly in its heyday, uh, at certainly, you know, Halloween, as it traditionally was considered, was still a time when the world got turned upside down. Again, for one night. And think of all the things that children were allowed to do that they would typically not do otherwise. And that's really what Bakhtin is talking about. It's a social safety valve that siphons off whatever feelings that people may have to repress certain things, uh, but it allows them to, to vicariously enjoy that kind of freedom that they don't typically have because the behavior is sometimes bordering on criminal. Okay. So Bakhtin was looking at Carnival and the spirit of Carnival as it appeared in literature, and in particular, the work of François Rabelais. That's a picture of him there. And what he noticed was how these, these texts were always challenging authority, right? High authority uh, mixed in. So you have high culture, which of course would include authority, as well as reason, rationality, science versus that earthy lower kind of comedy which is associated with the peasantry now we don't have the peasantry anymore we have lower you know lower class the working class that's about as close as it gets but carnivalized text would challenge that authority and ask why right so what was happening is there was always the potential right for these sites of opposition literary or otherwise to be to to oppose that dominant ideology, the dominant figures of authority, which at that time were the church and, you know, and royalty, uh, because everything either came from the pulpit or from the throne. And we didn't have, you know, bureaucrats at this point. We didn't have, you know, elected governments. So 
the notion of carnival now becomes sort of uh, dissipated in you know this kind of postmodern world. But at that time, when let's say things were simpler, uh, more clearly defined, we'll say, but that that hierarchy, that structured society, clearly, if you had those feelings, there would be the potential for opposition. Uh, but did it ever lead to uh, revolts? No, really not, not in particular. So the last thing I'd like to have a look at, this is a, a fairly lengthy clip. So I put the times down. I believe it's around the, the minute two to about minute eight, uh, talking about the grotesque body. And again, this notion that we saw of, you know, um, Harpo Marx running around is the, one of the, the Ciccolini brothers, you know, pulling things out of his lower pockets, really, you know, fascinated with, with just the lower extremities. And then we have the Trump, you know, on this toilet and so on. Think of all of that, but watch this clip on the grotesque body because it has uh, sort of really good ideas that belong to Bakhtin uh, that are specific to his ideas, but also specific to what we're looking at in terms of humor. So we're going to come back and wrap up. Okay, so uh, rebellion, disorder uh, with carnival, it's attractive and it is occurring at a certain time, but we need to keep in mind that the kinds of behaviors that would be considered carnivalesque under any other conditions will be considered dangerous and antisocial. So we are uh, we're aware that this kind of behavior is irrational and bordering on dangerous, uh, dangerous, but the notion of disorder and chaos, that is completely incompatible with social stability. The same way Roger Scruton last week had mentioned, you know, how um, it is very dangerous for us to be thinking about incongruities all the time. So it would be kind of like the purge, right? We don't want that. We can entertain vicariously the idea of a purge for 12 hours the way it is in the movies, but we want to make sure that for the most part, uh, disorder and chaos are kept either in one place or not at all. So it is going to compete with social stability. So here is a, an issue that really becomes important when we talk about carnival. If it is going to be uh, the site of revolutionary action, because remember, it gets turned upside down and peasants or the working class, you know, rule the day. Typically, they never do. We're never in a position of power because we are working class or peasants. So that moment of revolution uh, is something that is in that site only potentially, and that's it. And most, the, most people that engage in carnivalistic behavior know that. So even the word revolution, right, is problematic. Because if you look it up in the dictionary, are we implying a radical change? or simply a movement right back to a starting point. And if carnival is revolutionary, it's really the second one, isn't it? Because society and authority figures don't go away. They are in fact reconstituted. So revolution in this place is the kind of, not a political version, but the kind of standard version, a complete revolution back to a starting point. That's what carnival is. So I know it went a little bit long, an hour and 17 minutes, uh, lots of clips, hopefully some pretty interesting stuff that kind of ties everything all together. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to, because it's gone for quite some time, I'm going to present a very quick uh, video after just giving you the highlights of what is important in this, uh, this particular batch of slides, because there's a lot of material. So I'm going to come back very shortly with this one and then post both of those in lieu of our uh, meeting on Monday uh, because it is family day. So let's enjoy our families because we haven't seen them for minutes, maybe hours, you know, because we're all under the same roof. But we're not going to have a meeting Monday, but I will come back with a short video of just the main points, the main highlights to consider. So take care and I shall see you shortly.